Welcome to the Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Seal, a fellowship trained spine surgeon. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. Today we'll be talking about three different types of fusion techniques to treat lumbar foramen stenosis. Before you get too scared off by the word fusion, please know that fusing one or two levels in the spine does not make you stiff, doesn't necessarily restrict your range of motion, and secondly, once you're fused and that fusion is healed and solid, I do not restrict my patients from doing any activities, including mountain biking, skiing, playing football, etc. The first is called an A-lift, which is an anterior lumbar inner body fusion. The next is something called an L-lift, or a lateral lumbar inner body fusion. And then there's something called a T-lift, which is transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion. So there's an A-lift, which is done from the front, anterior L-lift, lateral, done from the side, or transforaminal, uh, done from the back. Sometimes you'll see the term P-lift, or posterior lumbar inner body fusion. That's kind of similar to a T-lift, also done posteriorly. So an anterior lumbar inner body fusion is done through a small incision over the abdomen. Um, obviously there are structures in the way, so the risks of surgery, um, the bowel is there, the bladder is there, there's lots of blood vessels in the front of the spine. Interestingly, um, this is a very, very elegant approach, it's very common. We usually do it with the help of a vascular surgeon because the vascular surgeon helps us navigate the blood vessels. But the really nice thing about an ALIF is in the front, you don't see a ton of nerves. So in the front of the spine, in order to take that disc out, once you navigate around all the blood vessels, you see the entire disc. So the exposure is usually very, very good. In men in particular, there's a risk of something called retrograde ejaculation. There are nerves at the front of the lumbar spine that are microscopic that for a male, they actually control your uh, ability to have an ejaculate. So there's about a 3% chance of injury to what's called a, the parasympathetic plexus if that happens and you're a male, you can still have an erection, you can still have an orgasm, you just don't have an ejaculate. If you're a guy that wants to have kids, I usually recommend donating to your sperm bank if you're going to have an anterior lumbar inner body fusion, just in case. So once we expose the disc in the front, we take the disc out in entirety, and in its place, we put a cage, and the cage is usually quite a large cage. So here's an A-lift cage. So this A-lift cage, you can see there's a hole in it, and it's basically filled with a bone growing substance called BMP, which is a very powerful bone growing substance. Um, that substance at uh, very low doses has not been shown to have issues at high doses. There was a loose link to cancer, but at the doses we use it at, there isn't. But basically with the use of BMP, the fusion rate's almost 100%. But if you put BMP or bone graft in that cage and basically insert it into where the disc used to be, that's an A-lift. That's an anterior lumbar and body fusion. Um, here you can see an x-ray. This is a picture of the cage that went in. You can see in the back there are also screws that are supplementing as well. So that's the A-lift. The next one's called an L-lift or lateral lumbar inner body fusion. So um, here you can see is a picture of the patient on the side. Very minimally invasive approach. The incision's only about that big, a um, few inches long, and it's done with tubular retractors. Um, and basically we go through the side, skirt around a bunch of structures. You do have to go through um, a little muscle called a psoas muscle in order to get to the disc. Um, and that's why some people will have a little bit of pain from going through that psoas muscle. But from the side, you can use a tube and visualize through a little hole like that, the side of the spine. Once you're to the side of the spine, we use instruments to take out the disc, almost like a channel. And once we take the disc out, again, just like the A-lift, we can put in a cage. And the cage that we use it's a little bit smaller than the A-lift cage front back because it's a channel type discectomy. So once that disc is out on the side, we put in the lateral cage like this from the side. And so you can see compared to the A-lift cage, it's a little bit wider, but not as big front back because you're not coming through the anterior type approach. So the lateral fusion is a great option. I like that option, particularly higher up in the lumbar spine, L2, 3, L3, 4. Sometimes at L4, L5, there is a link to um, what's called a femoral nerve palsy. So there are nerves that drape, particularly L4, L5, right over the front of the disc space. Um, and so at L4, L5 in particular, a relatively well-known kind of side effect of the operation is numbness and tingling and sometimes pain on the side of the approach because of nerve stretch. It almost always does get better, but it's a known kind of side effect of the lateral approach. And also because you go through that muscle, which is a psoas muscle, some people get some 
um, issues when they're lifting their hip up, they can get some pain because of some disruption of that muscle. But the lateral lumbar fusion is a great approach. I very much like that surgery, um, particularly for certain indications in order to give good stability to the spine. The next approach is the T-lift, which is I would say probably the most common approach for a lumbar fusion these days, the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. So that involves typically going from the back and taking this joint off, it's called the facet joint. Once you remove the facet joint, you can easily have access to the disc and you take the disc out and then put a cage in. The cage used for a T-lift is the smallest of the three cages because you have these little yellow things in the back called nerves and you so can't really negotiate around the nerve safely without a small cage. Um, and so this is what a T-lift cage looks like. So you can see it's a little bit smaller um, and still has a hole where you can put bone graft. But basically this cage, once the disc is out, the cage is put in from the back into the disc. And here you can see um, an x-ray of a T-lift cage with bone screws in the back. Um, the T-lift does not come with the risk of bowel injury, vessel injury, femoral nerve palsy, etc. But it definitely has a disadvantage of having a smaller footprint. Um, there's different kind of strategies we can use to do a really nice discectomy, still remove all that disc so the bone can grow across. And very often we'll pack bone graft into the disc space defect and then put the cage in. Um, the the A-lift, the L-lift, the T-lift are all meant, really the cage is meant to give it structural height and there's bone graft or BMP in between that allows bone to grow. Almost all of these inner body fusion techniques requires the place in what's called pedicle screws in order to hold the bone stable so that the bone can grow across the cage. These screws are placed from back to front, which means that if you've had an A-lift or a ladder, we have to position you face down with your back up. The screws are called pedicle screws. Here's a good example of a pedicle screw. You'll see what that looks like. In the setting of indirect decompression, pedicle screws are typically placed in what's called a minimally invasive type manner, which requires making two incisions on either side of the spine just off of midline so we can place these screws from back to front. In order to do this minimally invasively, we have to use a fancy intraoperative image guidance in order to guide these screws because we're not opening the entire spine, we're just doing it through two smaller incisions. Two small incisions obviously leads to less blood loss, faster recovery, and less pain. Here's an example of a minimally invasively placed pedicle screw. And here you'll see that the screw is placed from back to front. So for example, this would be the L4 body, that would be the L5 body. And here's a screw into L4, there's a screw in L5. And these screws have tabs, and these tabs are used because when done minimally invasively, we have to be able to guide what's called a rod from top down. And then we lock this rod to the screws in order to provide stability between these two segments. So here's a good model of an A-lift that was done in the front. Then you can flip to the back and these are screws that are placed into L4 and L5. And then you can see that the screws are then attached together by this rod and locked down. When placing pedicle screws, we use our experience, image guidance, and monitoring. Despite our best efforts, if there's a problem with the screw placement and it's irritating a blood vessel or a nerve, we have to come back to revise a screw. Risk of screw my placement is extremely low, particularly with the use of navigation guidance. It's around one in a hundred. Other long-term risks include non-union, meaning the bone has not successfully fused across that segment, and also something called adjacent level disease. I mentioned earlier that if we fuse one or two segments in the spine, while you may not feel stiff and your activities won't be limited, your spine internally will obviously be stiff at that one segment that we fused. So if you fuse L4, L5, as you flex forward and backwards, the levels above and below, so L3, 4 and L5, S1 are gonna pick up the slack. That means there's gonna be a little bit more stress on those adjacent levels that can lead to something called adjacent level disease, which simply means that you may develop issues like disc herniation, disc degeneration, stenosis, bone spurs, at the levels above or below your fusion. The rate of adjacent level disease is around one and a half to 3% per year per level, which means that 10 years is a 15 to 30% chance you might develop some issues above or below the fusion that may or may not require surgery. Sometimes you don't always have to put screws in the back, particularly if you're doing an A-lift or an ALIF. 
So you can do what's called a standalone A-lift, which is taking the disc out from the front, putting a cage in, and then putting screws up and down. And that creates indirect decompression alone and is biomechanically strong enough without having to put the screws in back. You'll have to talk to your surgeon to see if you need posterior screws as well as an A-lift for indirect decompression. Typically, if it's an indirect decompression, and we do the indirect decompression and patients still have pain at three to six months, we get a repeat MRI, repeat CT, if there still is nerve compression because that space wasn't enough that was created up down that we could go back and just do a micro, micro decompression frame anatomy to really make sure that nerve has freedom. So what are the benefits of surgery? Surgery is much better for treating, again, buttock and leg pain than back pain, particularly for foramal stenosis. From a leg pain perspective, in terms of buttock and leg pain, there's about a 90 to 95% chance of taking away the majority of the pain. So what does majority mean? Majority means more than half. It is unrealistic to expect to have zero leg pain after surgery. And that's because there's already some injury to the nerve that's probably already occurred before we got there to do the surgery. Most of my patients based on our registry have a pre-operative leg pain score of about a seven and a half to eight out of 10. And at one year post-operatively about a one and a half to two out of 10. So again, much better than it was before surgery just not perfect, and that is because of probably some nerve injury that's already occurred. It is important also to understand that nerves take a long time to heal, and I usually don't make a judgment on how much leg pain goes away until one year, because it can take up to a year for those nerves to heal. In terms of back pain relief, there's about an 80% chance of taking away the majority of back pain, so meaning more than half. Back pain's a lot tougher, just in general from a surgical treatment standpoint. That's why we like to operate on patients that have more leg pain than back pain. We have lots of literature to suggest that doing an indirect decompression with an inner body cage to create room for that nerve can be very effective for a patient's quality of life if their quality of life is inhibited by buttock and leg pain and back pain. Here's a couple of good examples of patients that have foramal stenosis where we did selective inner body fusions. You'll see a scoliosis that's pretty significant. Now, a scoliosis of this degree, sometimes um, surgeons may do rod screws and cages all the way from T10 to the pelvis, which is a really big operation. This patient really only had L4 nerve pain in the buttock and leg down to the foot and did not want a big operation. So we use diagnostic nerve blocks to figure out where this patient had uh, the most uh, amount of pain and what nerve it was coming from. So it was coming from the right side L4 nerve because we blocked the L4 nerve, the patient got relief. And here you can see lots of uh, collapse from that scoliosis at the L4, L5 level in the x-ray as well as the CT. Um, and here's a side view of the CT where you can see at the L4, L5 level, there's lots of collapse in that foramen relative to the patient's other side as well as relative to the L5, S1 foramen below. So what we did was we did a front back uh, indirect decompression. This is an A-lift and ALIF. So we went to the front of the spine, took the disc out, put a cage in to give height to that foramen. And after we gave height to that foramen, flipped the patient over and then put in these screws in a minimally invasive type manner. Um, and you can see the difference at this level, at the L4, L5 level, you can see how much that foramen opened on that right side compared to the pre-op image. Now this patient still has scoliosis above, uh, patient's doing great, but there is a chance that this patient breaks down because of the scoliosis and abnormal curvature above this fusion. When that happens, if it's symptomatic, we'll deal with it then. Here's a patient with scoliosis, which is abnormal curvature. Now this abnormal curvature is causing biomechanical compression because of that curvature uh, and tilt. This is at the L3, 4, and L4, L5 level. This is a lateral lumbar fusion we did. So we did an L-lift. You can see postoperatively, we straightened both levels. We we're able to correct that deformity to go from there to there and thereby opening up the space for the nerve. And in the back, again, we put um, uh, minimally invasive pedicle screws in. And last but not least, this happens to be my mother. So my mom, uh, she was 75 when she had surgery, and she is against like all types of surgery, did everything non-operative, but she was having so much pain from the L5 nerve at the L5 S1 level. Here you can see her frame in L4, L5. There's the L4 nerve coming out. And L5 S1 is not horrible, but it's real. She definitely does have some compression up down at the L5 S1 level with compression of the L5 nerve. We did injection after injection. At, at one point, she essentially couldn't walk more than one or two blocks without 10 out of 10 buttock and leg pain and said she'd rather be dead than live with that type of pain. Um, so what we ended up doing was a uh, anterior lumbar inner body fusion. Anterior lumbar inner body fusion. Uh, we did this case without actually screws in the back. We did indirect compression with an A-lift where we took the disc out, 
and elevated that space. And here you can see postoperatively for L5 S1 foramen where the L5 nerve lives is just as tall as the L4 L5 foramen. Um, and she got almost 100% relief in buttock and leg pain. I think it's now five or six years later. She's walking miles at a time and traveling. So if I let my mom have surgery for foramen stenosis, I can tell you that it can be extremely effective. Hopefully you learned something about the three different types of inner body fusion techniques for the surgical treatment of lumbar foramen stenosis. Thanks for watching and don't forget to click the like and subscribe button.